And good afternoon. This is Erfan Ibrahim of the Smart Grid Educational Series. Our seminar today is on the subject of asset management. And we are going to tackle two aspects of asset management. One is how asset management is important for Smart Grid, because these days everybody wants to know how anything affects Smart Grid. So naturally, there's a need to know how asset management affects smart grid. But also, there are a lot of organizations in the commercial and industrial sectors that are going through sustainability projects. By sustainability projects, I'm talking about they're looking very carefully at their energy, water, fuel use, how they're dealing with waste whether it is waste from the sewage system or whether it's waste from the materials that people are using or it's industrial waste. And sustainability, the concept of sustainability is how do you deal with all of these variables in a way that minimizes your carbon footprint, minimizes the use of raw materials, maximizes recycling, while keeping costs to a minimum and providing customers the best service possible with safety, reliability, and all those good non-functional attributes. Asset management is very critical to conceptualizing sustainability projects, carrying them out, and then analyzing the results from them. And if we think about multiple phases of anything. So like for instance in Smart Grid, we came up with the concept of Smart Grid, then there were some initial designs, then we have implementation going on, and then there will be an operational phase where there will be maintenance, and then eventually there will be an end of life for a variety of these technologies and they'll be cycled out and new products will come in. In each one of those phases, Asset management is very important in order to know that you're doing your business correctly. It creates a sense of accountability. It creates a sense of transparency. And it also allows multiple parties to interact with each other in a way uh, that reduces the contention. Some of you uh, may occasionally hear the sound go out, that is just simply because you are in an audio broadcast through the internet and temporarily your internet connection may lose the sound. So I beg your forgiveness for that. Uh, if you have an issue, persistent issue, you can dial 650-479-3208, put in the access code that you got in the registration and come in over the telephone and you will get a very good sound of the audio. So coming back to the subject at hand, asset management. So you can see that asset management is one of those unsung heroes in both smart grid and sustainability projects. It's something that people just take for granted. When you probe them further, you find out that they have a concept of an Excel spreadsheet in their head. And it's not more sophisticated than that. Well, in reality, asset management is a lot more than an Excel spreadsheet. And if enterprises are relying on these flat sheets for data in asset management, they're not really getting the benefit of the field of asset management. All they're doing is doing record keeping. And it's in the real time operations, in the dynamically changing environment that smart grid and sustainability projects will both show that you need to have the data be live. Live data means that you can extract it quickly and you can update it quickly from information that is coming from the environment you're in. And flat spreadsheets that are manually intensive, it's very difficult to do that kind of thing. So there are a variety of companies that are involved in the area of asset management a lot of companies that produce products in the enterprise resource planning area, ERP systems, 
have modules for asset management. And then there are companies that just do asset management. And many times those companies' tools are used in ERP systems that have an asset management module for creating enhanced reporting and tracking. We have with us a person from one such company. The company is called Sunflower Systems. And the person from Sunflower Systems is a person by the name of Robert Kaler. We, he goes by Bob, and that's how we'll refer to him in the seminar today. And Bob has extensive experience. For those of you who are here in the seminar as well as on the webinar, I've sent you a bio, so I won't get into the details of that. But let me just say that Bob has had a lot of experience with industry where he goes and listens to what their needs are first before he starts talking. And that is a very unique skill in the market. So with that, Bob. Okay. Thank you very much, Erfan. Thank you uh, to everyone that's on the webinar across the globe and everybody that's in the room here. Um, and uh, again, yes, I... Uh, I'd like to start by saying that I'm really not an energy guy. And I know most people here are very dialed in to the smart grid and the energy sector. Uh, but I started looking at this a few years ago and I started listening because I'm really an asset guy. It's, uh, so my perspective is, is that I look at the world through this lens that's focused on what I call our stuff. And my subtitle of this is Stuff Matters. And when you look around everything, everybody's got a lot of stuff. And I don't care if you're in your house and you got all kinds of stuff, but you need to know what you have. You need to know why you have it. What are you using it for? Um, a person that works with me does a training, and they came up with a great idea. They were doing some training, and people don't understand the value of asset management. And so what she does is she says, open up your purse or your wallet, but don't open up yet. Take it up, put it up on the desk now, get a piece of paper and write everything that's in there. Write everything that's in your purse or wallet. And then go back and take a look if you got it right. And most of the times you don't have it right, you don't have you don't know how much money's in there, you missed a credit card, you missed some other things, and it's amazing what you don't have. So it's really important to know what you have. But the things that you have in business, whether it's in the smart grid, whether it's managing your business, whether it's looking at sustainability issues, everything should have its place. It should be adding value to the mission. If it's not adding value to the mission, you are wasting resources, the resources that it took to buy it, to acquire it, to use it, to keep it into place, and eventually to retire it or reuse it somehow. And it all requires a lot. So what I really focus on are the things we learned at school. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. But that's pretty complex when you're talking about an, an asset. And you want to look at who's got it, where is it, what is it. And that's not just saying it's a computer. There are a lot of things underneath, a lot of attributes that these assets have that you capture in context to your particular role. And it's really important because assets are used by everybody through the organization and all segments of the organization look at it, but they have different things that they're looking for and different things that they're looking about. And you've got all these interdependencies. A finance person is looking at an asset completely different than a maintenance person is, completely different than the user is completely different than the manager that's responsible for the production line to get something out in that asset. And so everybody's looking at it. So the information is really important. So what we know about our assets need to be shared, and it needs to be shared with a lot of different disciplines. And at the end of the day, assets are all about having the right thing in the right place at the right time. And by doing so, you're going to provide the highest levels of service, you're going to maximize utilization of what you have, and you're going to do it for the lowest cost possible. Now, historically, asset management has been a very narrow focus. And if you look at most organizations, they've got many silos of asset management within their organization. 
Most people look at it and they think about asset management, they think about maintenance and reliability. The old CMMS systems, right? Computerized Maintenance Management System. They're the asset managers. They have the work orders, they just make sure it stays running. And they're looking at it, but they're looking at it from a narrow perspective. There's other silos that are just looking at the cost of operation. Those are typically called enterprise asset management systems. You hear that EAM system, and they're really saying, oh, what do we have? What are we, what are we capturing in terms of cost? How often are we using it? What are we getting there? And then there's asset management in the financial side. I'm not talking about asset management of our bonds and our savings accounts because there's a whole other asset management that we're not talking about today on that. But when I say from the financial side, they want to know what they have for depreciation purposes. What do we put up on the books? We're going to depreciate it. We're putting up on our balance sheet. We're tracking it that way. And then there's a whole level of asset management that's in the supply chain. And you'll talk to people that are in the supply chain, and they'll say, well, we're doing asset management, and that's tracking my goods as I move it from where I am now to where I hand it off to someone else. And then finally, the last place where we see asset management is in risk mitigation. And what do I mean by that? Keeping track of stuff, making sure you have it. It's the control. The old property control people and the old big aerospace companies. And we've worked with a lot of those people. And I've, and I've talked about, let me talk about my, where I come from context, three different organizations I've worked with. One is the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. The things that they track are amazing. It all comes, starts with their buildings, their facilities, their vehicles, their cars, their trucks, their assault vehicles, their weapons, their computers, the kits that they take out in the, in the road when they go out on the road and they need to investigate things, even things like their badges, which are important, they don't want to lose those badges, and they're keeping control of all these things in a single system and utilizing it for what they're looking at. And now they're doing some things with asset management regarding environmental concerns and sustainability. We also have worked with organizations like Stanford University. Completely different, completely different view of what they use things for, but yet they still have a lot of different things. They got facilities, they got buildings, they got lab equipment, they have data centers, they have vehicles, they've got carts, lots of different things, and they are all looking at those. And then a third one um, that is uh, worth looking at is somebody like Bonneville Power Administration who has a whole separate set of assets that they want to track. And they're keeping, keeping track of big power grids and all of their, their operations related to that. But at the end of the day, they're all doing the same thing. They're saying, what do I have? What are the unique things about this that I need to track? Who's got it? What's it being used for? What's it costing me to do that? What's its condition? How long have I had it? When do I might need to replace it? What's its impact on our business? What is, is its criticality? And then all of the other individual aspects to that that are going to be important for the individual different disciplines that will be going to use that item. So I say that there's many dimensions of an asset. And you've got a core asset record. And you capture lots of different elements of data as it goes through. Specific things. When I acquire it, I want to capture a lot of information about it. Who I bought it from, how much did it cost, but other things. Does it have an EP certification if it's a computer? What kind of fuel does it use if it's a particular vehicle? What kind of uh, draw is it going to have if it's electronic components? Is it hazardous? And there are all kinds of different contexts, and you're going to capture that because that needs to follow that through the asset because that's going to be important to different people in a different process. And you're going to go through and you're going to need to, to put it onto your financial books. And so the financial people get in there, and there are financial aspects to that you want to capture. As you go through the normal operations, you're going to manage it. You're going to take care of it. You're going to move it. People are going to look at it. People are going to use it. You may need to upgrade it. And then you're going to go do things, and you're going to review it. You need to do a physical inventory for your SOX compliance. Every two years, you've got to go do a physical inventory or find it. More frequently than that, you need to go out and do a condition assessment 
so that you need to keep your repairs up to date. You want to kind of take a look at it. It may be subject to agreements. You may have it on a maintenance contract with someone. It might be on a warranty. You might have given it to a subcontractor to perform the work on your behalf within the organization. So you've got lots of different agreements that you might be looking at it. You might be looking at data that comes in through electronics means, auto discovery, or it, it's a self-discoverable asset and it's going to provide you information about itself to you on a regular basis and you need to capture that. And then there's a the whole process of what if I really don't need this? What do we do with it? And believe it or not, the excess and surplus process is the significant part of the asset life cycle. What do I do? How do I recycle it? How do I reuse it? Is it do, I, do I have export controls? There's a lot of things. And, and many of the people I work with tell me 50% of their effort goes with end of life of an asset. And what do we redo with that asset? So you're going to capture all this different information from different contexts, and this is just at one level. Now, if we start going talking about some particular things, if you start talking about aircraft, you've got some really specific things that you need to capture about that and ongoing things. If you're talking about electronic equipment, same thing. If you're talking about vehicles, same thing. If you're talking about computers, there's some specific things you want to find out about computers. The list goes on and on. So this asset has many dimensions, and to come back to what Airfond said, you can't do that in an Excel spreadsheet. That'll tell you what you have, and that's about it. But assets, it's a lot more than that. Because assets are probably the largest thing most companies have. Look at their balance sheet, plant, property, and equipment. That's a big number. And it's really important to manage that quite effectively because of all the dollars that are invested in that. So I've just put up this little graphic about the asset life cycle because so often people acquire something and then they put it in place and they don't bother looking at it until it's broken or until it's off the books. They don't even go looking for it. That's yesterday's paradigm. Today's paradigm is that we need to manage this day in, day out. And so we acquire it, we deploy it, we put it through, we look at it, we use materials along with it, we need to keep track. So through it, your process is you acquire it, you use it, and you dispose of it and you capture information as you go through that entire process. And you bring that information in and that provides you with the data points that you can ma start making strategic and operational decisions based on how that asset is performing today or how your business is performing and needs the use of those assets. So I've listed a whole bunch of different asset activities. And why did I do this? It's because I want you to realize that things happen to these all the time. And if you capture this data, this is going to tell you what your assets are doing, and you're going to be able to bring that forward and use that information to strategically right-size what you have for the use that's there. So you can see that you know everything from doing asset maintenance and work order management and IT asset management, there's a lot of different functions that go along with an asset. And you really have two choices today. You can either have about a dozen different systems to capture this information in and they're not going to talk to each other, or you can say, we want to do proper asset management, we're going to put the asset in and we're going to centralize the data and put all the data in so that we can share that data with everyone that needs to have a part of that asset in their mission. So as we go through these activities, you start capturing this. This becomes time-based information. And time-based information is what is going to give you the value. Knowing you have something is great. You know you have something. How that is performing, how it's being used, the relative performance of that is where you're going to get the maximum value especially as we move forward as things such as the smart grid are using these assets in very, what I'll call, mission-critical environments. So we capture all this information, and there's lots of different asset types. 
and they're used across organizations. So you've got real property, you've got buildings, facilities, you've got all kinds of different equipment, tagged parts, spare parts, materials, tools that go along with it. You may have leased items. You've got IT assets, which is a whole segment of the asset base. And yet, so often that's in a, in a silo and it's viewed just operational with the IT people. And that's great. And you want IT people to have that. You want the maintenance people. You want the fleet people to be able to do their unique job with those items. Yet at the same time, it is really important that you be able to capture the information so that you can capture the subset that you need for strategic information. The information that's going to be out on the fringe, out on the edge of that circle, most of that is very unique to the discipline that they're doing. Real property, some specific things about real property. That you don't need to capture, somebody needs to change some light bulbs. Do you really need to track that? Usually not at that level. But the fact that you maybe swap out all the ballots, that becomes important and that's data that you want to put in for strategic information. Same thing happens with all of the different silos that we see. So consolidating the information is really very, very important to maximizing the value of your assets in your organization. By doing so, we get to the main crux, which is decision support. We are now going to make decisions. And those decisions, they don't have to be just strategic. So often we think about strategic decisions, and those are really important. But you also make managerial decisions, how we're running our business and operational decisions, what we're doing with those things. And the value of that information to provide that is unparalleled relative to the information that you would be trying to achieve your objectives without. So you need to pull this information in, look at it, analyze it, and bring it together. And that's what I wanted to talk about today, primarily is how we're gonna do that. So before I get started, I started writing this, uh, this, this discussion and I want to talk about it, and it struck me, and I said, wait a second, this sounds eerily like a presentation I did one year ago this month in front of the National Education Seminar for the National Property Management Association. They are federal government, federal government contractors, big universities, and they um, have a set of standards and a lot of training, and they help organizations track their stuff. And what I wanted to talk about was the new technologies that we really need to embrace around assets. Because again, it's, it's no longer just putting it into a spreadsheet or tracking it or just keeping it. A lot of people used to keep it on cards, right? And the maintenance, everything was done. It was clipboards and cards. And the technology has changed. And these are technologies that I believe are the real difference maker and what is going to be really the standard moving forward. So I wanted to just adjust these. Number one is the cloud. Now I use the cloud in quotes here because what I really mean by the cloud is an environment at which data can be shared, where there are open APIs so that there are some standards for how you look at data and put it together. So when I say the cloud, I say that to people because they view it, well, maybe that's my Google, my Google news feed. That's coming out of the cloud. Well, look at all the different elements that it's pulling together. The cloud is one of these technologies that has enabled us to bring all of this different data together where we can share it. And so we're no longer running in a silo on a box in one place that's a standalone. And by this is going to allow us to start sharing data in ways that we've never really been able to do it before. The proliferation of data integration has been just astounding over the last five years. The, e the ease at which you can do it today and share information bi-directionally is really, really a cool thing for all of us that are out here today. The second thing, the technology that must be used is this concept of asset metadata. And I'm talking about all of the different things about this asset because there's this, there's this standard stuff that we've got make, model, manufacture, great. But then there's all this contextual information. 
that we can use. We can look at operating conditions of it. We can look at some physical stuff about it. We can look at some, some information that's going to tell us. So if we're talking about a car or a vehicle or a truck, we can talk about number of axles, type of fuel, engine size. We can look at number of doors, things like that. If we're talking about electronic equipment, it's going to tell us draw. It's going to tell us what power requirements that we need, how often something needs to be done, if there are some, some particular um, types of maintenance things that need to be done. So all this metadata is going to be out there, and it's going to be attached at the asset level. But it can be done a little bit higher than the asset level at a family level, like what I call the catalog level. So getting this data out there is now we can capture that. We've got all this, this other data out there that's related to this asset that we can use quite effectively. The third thing that we're seeing is smart devices. Now, I know I put these up with uh, some phones and some, uh, some other you know, smartphones and things like that, but there's a lot of different smart devices out there. And being able to capture the information from smart devices as well as using these smart devices to, to, to enable processes are critical to asset management. So instead of somebody going out with a clipboard and doing something, they can take a smart device out there and it's real-time actual data being put into play right away. Same thing goes for these smart devices that can talk back to the mothership, so to speak. It's a lot of devices out there. How many people know that you're, how many people get the printer messages now that tell you, hey, we're a little low on paper. We need paper in there. The ink's getting low, order more ink. Well, there's a lot of smart devices and that's giving us information back that we can take and that we can use. And that's particularly effective in things like the smart grid where there's a lot of smart devices out there that are communicating back now and we have to be able to use that technology. We've got to embrace that technology when we start looking at these things. Then comes something that I made up called the social collaborative network. That's a combination between social and collaborative. Because people are more and more working in collaborative environments, but they're doing it. The, the advent of things like LinkedIn and Facebook and Google Plus, things become more of a social matter now. And so when there's things that get done with assets, Right? It used to be pick up the phone, and you'd pick up the phone and you'd talk to someone, you'd get it done, and they'd write it on their little clipboard, and they would go, and it was really good, and you got a lot of communication going. Well, we, we moved away from that to email or um, text message or however you communicate with people, and then it's opened up again where you can have a conversation, but that network will allow us to capture that with, with regards to what's going on with an asset. So using that network and bringing other people in is going to have an impact on how assets get used, updated, repaired, maintained, acquired, disposed of, and it's going to be in this new paradigm, what I call the, this, this, this social collaborative network because you're collaborating, but you're doing it in a social way and reconnecting with people. The next technology trend that I told people to look out for was what I call 140 characters. And we can look at it like Twitter, but people are getting used to sending little messages, but it's more than that. Because instead of putting a field in anymore into data, you can send more data. You know, there's RFID tags on things. Are you familiar with RFID? Right, RFID tags? Well, a lot of people just use that, they'll snap it and they'll think it's just an ID number. There can be a lot more information on that ID tag. You see what they do on the airplanes. You, know, you shoot that and it'll tell you the date manufactured, when's the next date it needs to be done. So there's these bits of information that are out there. And it's not paragraphs of information, but it's enough information to give you, to give you what you need, yet it's still not just this one little data item that gets them stuffed into a database. Video and voice. Well, in the asset management world, you know, what we're talking about today, this may not have as much impact, but in a lot of places that we do asset management, it is important. You take a picture of something. When something's on, you can go ahead and use your smart device, which we talked about a minute ago, and say, hey, I've got this problem with this thing, and I'm going to get there. goes into the database, moves up there. 
you can take a video. You can also go the other direction. Somebody needs to look at something. I need to, to be able to know how to operate this particular piece of equipment. And you can shoot a video right down to their smart device. They can look at it in a way that they go. So the video and voice is something that's come up and that technology is going to be great. Now, some things I like. Self-identifying assets. Hello, I'm out here. I'm on a network now. It's amazing how many things are on the network. In the production world, everything's sending data back to you. Well, if you've just got a standard spreadsheet for your asset management system, you can't pick this up. And this is the real value of, these, of, of the next generation of all of these things, this stuff that we have. It's going to tell us what I'm doing and what's going on. So being able to ping an asset and it'll tell you, I am sick today, right? Or everything's going great, here I am, I'm still here. And you can look at your assets, comes back, and they will self-identify themselves, tell you what's wrong if there's an issue, and they also try to self-correct themselves. Intelligence and algorithms are being, being developed so that people would be able to to, um, or, or these assets will be able to try and reboot themselves and come back up. Location awareness. One of the biggest things is getting lost assets. If they're not plugged into a wall, they tend to move around. So being able to have location awareness for these assets, whether it's GPS on vehicles, whether it's um, RFID, whether it's using Wi-Fi networks in hospitals where they can say where is that particular cart, they can look at it, identify it right away. Things have their location awareness now, and that's also important because how different assets perform may depend on the location of where they are. And it's good to have that location information. So these self-aware assets that are self-identifying and that will provide your, your location automatically provide significant benefits. One of the very interesting things is visualization. You can now look at maps. It's amazing what's been done in the last few years in terms of being able to look at things in real time on screens in real maps. And that's what visualization is all about. Being able to draw up, pull up 1001 East Hillsdale, go to the fourth floor, drill into this room and see what's exactly in this room. Drill back out, go look at your network and be able to see how everything in the network is put together by using self-identifying assets, location technologies, painting it on the screen, having the contextual information, and it'll drive it for you. This is very exciting technology for people to go out and take a look at what they have and be able to see it in real time. Streaming information, all right? So number 10, we got all kinds of information that's streaming now, real time data. You know, no longer have to wait for the guys with the punch cards in the back to feed them all through the machine and a week and a half later the data's in, get your reports. It's real time data now. Information is streaming. RFID enables us to stream information, doing a real time transaction. Transactions being done on smartphones. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm fixing this thing right now. I can shoot the barcode, automatically takes my location. I can say what I did and it's real time and it goes up and lets people know when things are moving around, it needs to go. When you're dealing with something mission critical, something where there's a piece of equipment broken along the line and you need it done right away, the real time information is really, really valuable to be able to pull that up. Then we get into predictive modeling. This is a cool technology. This is looking at all of the information that you have, looking at the data, and then being able to make some assumptions and predict what's going to happen in the future with these items. It's used a lot in, uh, in production equipment. How, how often, mean time between failures, when do I need to repair something? I'm going to do my maintenance on it. I'm going to look at it. I'm going to predictively decide when to do that maintenance. 
And then the last thing is analytics. Because we've got all this data now. We've got a ton of different types of data elements relative to this asset from all aspects of its life, from its acquisition, through its use, through what it's doing right now in real time, and we'll be able to use analytical reporting tools to drill in and understand what we can do with these assets and get more value out of them, increase their utilization, return more dollars back to our bottom line, or quite, quite frankly, maybe it's just being able to provide better service and having more reliable, more uptime. What your mission is can vary, but it's the analytics that is going to provide you with the information that you can start doing what-if scenarios and being able to forecast as well as look at how you're performing today. So those are the 12 technologies, and the reason why I put those up there is because, to me, that's becoming very near and dear to what the smart grid looks like because it's using almost all of those technologies in a very proactive way to put the information to get the smart grid up and making sure it's robust. So let's talk about that for a second. Again, I, as I said when I started, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in the smart grid and I'm not an energy guy. Uh, I'm an asset guy. But I find it very interesting because stuff is stuff. And you need to track stuff, but you need to tr track it for different things. And the smart grid, I find to be a very, very interesting aspect because it's, it is a whole new paradigm. So I, you know, when I go out and say, well, what is a smart grid? And so if anybody is just wanting to know what definition I'm working off of, I got this off of the Department of Energy site. And the smart grid is, an, is just a grid that uses computers and technology to gather and act on information. You know, behaviors of suppliers and consumers in an automated fashion to improve the efficiency, reliability, economics, and sustainability of the production of the, of the production and distribution of electricity. And what got me there is that it's computers and it's sensors, and there is a ton of technology that has changed what the grid used to look like to where it is today. And because you've got all these new things, it's an opportunity to use that information about all those assets to feed the information back. Because the promise of the smart grid is absolutely unbelievable in terms of what it can bring back, the value, the amount of energy that it can save, the production of energy, what it can mean for our natural resource load, but also the delivery of services to people and getting the right energy to them at the right time and the right amounts without wasting it. So here's a, a list of a bunch of different technologies that are used in the smart grid. Integrated communications. I find this to be one of the most interesting things. It's at the top of the list because passing information between elements of the smart grid is critical. The very most important thing is being able to get the information between nodes, suppliers, items, assets, making sure that, that you can get messages back and forth. You've got these other technologies, sensing equipment, measuring equipment, a lot of different types of items out there that are going to tell you what's being used, how it's being used, and feeding that information back. There's self-healing types of devices out there. Then there's smart meters. Smart meters are pulling information bi-directionally. It can send information out, it can come back. We're right at the cusp of of this new smart meter and what it's going to do. And I think it's got some very interesting things for asset management that's going to come from the other side of it, which is what companies are doing with asset management. That integration is not there yet, but it's going to be there, and that's going to be some very interesting things. So you've got these smart meters out there, and they've got a lot of information that they're sending back and forth. You need to capture that information. 
And then there's just the PMUs, and I'm sure you all are familiar with the PMUs and looking at the data quality and widening it out against the, uh, the, the WAMS and pull all that together. So you've got this information that's coming in about the quality and where it's coming from, and you can capture that data. Advanced components, the technology is really continuing to, to move forward at a, just a breakneck pace. So there's going to be new things coming in, and you need to be able to capture this, the superconductors and things like that. The advanced control, part of that is that visualization. Can you go out and look at everything? You've got new control. You've got dashboards. You can see where things are going on, but those are pieces and assets that come in, and those are, those are leveraged by interfaces and decision support systems which again need to pull this data in from these different sources and allow you to consolidate it, look at it within the context that you need to look at it. And then there's the whole part of smart power generation, which is saying, well, at what point in the day the technologies, we can, we can use wind power, we can use some solar power, and we're going to make sure that we level and load level and, and bring that up and you're going to be able to view that because that's data that is coming across the grid that's related to a particular asset in a particular place relative to the other assets in the other places. So as we bring that up, all these technologies are coming up and they're integrating. And the most important thing is that you've got all of this information, what are you going to do with it? So I'm asking some questions here, something for you to think about. All right, so you're going to identify and manage all these assets that are on the grid. So what information can you collect? If you think about it, there is a lot of information why it's really important that you have a robust asset management system that will enable you to capture the different data elements related to this particular item that you need in order to maximize its usage. And who are we going to share this information with? And then what are they going to do with it when we send it to them? Because that's going to be important for us to say, okay, so we got this information. How do we send it back? What do they need? What data elements? I don't want to send them everything. That's too hard. And then what value does it get? And then the important thing is to look internally and externally because there are some external systems because the whole thing about the smart grid, right, it used to, the grid, as I understand it, used to be one direction. But from the power, out. Well, now you have panels everywhere. You've got wind turbines all over the place, and that's bringing power back into the grid. And that has made the entire process very interesting because now you've got this variance is these variables and these variances that you can manage. And you can look at it, and there's real-time information coming up, and you're sharing this information, and you're capturing it, and you're putting it into place, but you still have to do something with it relative to analytics and a lot of predictive modeling. If you go back to what I talked about earlier, you want, you're going to be able to take this information and start doing some predictive modeling about what things are going to look like. And then your analytics are going to tell you how well I did against that because you've got all these smart devices, you've got this environment where you can share information, where the data is going to be structured in a way that you can share it between different systems, different people, different organizations as necessary. And that's going to allow you to maximize the utilization of everything that's out there. Look at where there are issues, holes, deal with them, update it, Watch again, and then continue to go through your process of constant improvement based on metrics and analytics. So I just took this picture. I know that's kind of hard to read, but uh, the smart grid is out there. There's all kinds of different things that make up the smart grid. There are generation plants. There are private types of electrical generation. There is usage. 
If you look up up there, up in the corner, you're going to see that there's material coming in. When we ask, we look at asset management, there's some material. That's fuel, fuel for generating the power, perhaps. There are analytics. There are assets out there that are designed to watch other assets and then put algorithms in place, be able to do some self-healing if there is a problem on the grid. There's intelligence built in so that assets will take over and reroute if there are problems. And though you go through, there are, there are all types of different elements with all types of different individuals that are watching what's going on here. And I'm not talking about trying to manage your energy at, at a very low level and, and look at demand and things like that. That's a whole other discipline that's outside of what I want to try and talk about today. But just the fact that you've got all this stuff, tons of stuff, and it's getting information. And we can look at this and say, that's beautiful. It's in a beautiful, it's all together, it's perfect. You know, we've designed this and it looks great. But what information are we getting and what can we do with that information? And it is a, 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 just a veritable treasure trove of information that we can use in order to be very effective. Okay, so the benefits. If you ass assign a, an asset management program and you're looking at this and managing these assets quite effectively, you're going to see a very high up spike in reliability. That has been proven in CMMS systems and EAM systems, but asset management, knowing what you have and how it's performing, always helps with the reliability. And it's going to help with this flexibility in the network. Because again, our networks now are going to be far more dynamic. The smart grid is far more dynamic than anything we've seen up to this point. And it's going to continue to be extremely dynamic, probably more so as we go through. We are going to become more efficient. We're going to be able to look at load adjustments. We're going to look at uh, leveling, looking at peaks, enabling pricing considerations based on the information that we have there. And it's great for sustainability because we can look at the alternative energy sources that we have available to us. We cannot burn so much fuel if we are able to better manage what's coming in from different places. And that's all based on seeing that real-time information that's coming from the individual devices, but in context with the entire smart grid that, we're, that we are looking at in that particular point in time. And at the end, the smart grid is very much a market-enabling technology. You know, the, the demand response support, I, I saw a very good discussion on that uh, a couple of, couple of sessions ago, I think. And it's really a platform that you can start doing more and more things. And then finally, the little bit that I thought was interesting is that they say overbuild it. Put the smart grid out there, you can overbuild it in the same way that the phone companies overbuilt how much could go through their lines and then they started driving DSL through it, started driving cable TV through it. Well, if you build a smart grid and you put that out there and you build the grid, they say provision megabits have a lot of data capability because you can control the power. It doesn't take a whole lot of information and a lot of bits to get that data going back and forth and to do the control. But that gives you additional bandwidth that can be used for other things on the grid that you can provide for people. What that is, it's, that's for the MBAs to go figure out and the marketers to go get. But with, but with uh, overbuilt and wide open networks, you saw what it enabled people to do in terms of Wi-Fi and, uh, and high speed internet in their homes. So this is this next generation that's gonna be there. <coughs> so with that, let me, change gears a little bit because while asset management can really have an impact on the smart grid, I think it can also be a very big impact on how commercial organizations or universities or the federal government or anybody that's got a lot of stuff can be able to say, well, I've got all this stuff. What does it mean in terms of what I can do from a sustainability aspect? Because we've got initiatives in our organization to reduce our use of energy. And in order to do that, we can really use asset management. Because if you think about it, 
we've got all this information about our stuff. And if we know about our stuff, go ahead. Let's see if there are questions on the, okay. on the first section. Sure. So we're going to take this as an opportunity to ask questions on the first portion of Bob's presentation and give him a chance to catch his breath. We have a comment from Gary Sorkin who says, actually SIP, which stands for Critical Infrastructure Protection, 008, calls for an asset contingency plan of which his product sort of fits within. Mm -hmm. Okay. So thanks, Gary. You can ask other questions uh, in the audience. Critical infrastructure protection. This is the uh, National Electricity Reliability Corporation. It's a privately held organization and it is governed by rules from FERC, which is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and it has a set of rules by which bulk power generators and transmitters, in other words, all the large generation companies and transmission companies are governed by those rules. And there are penalties if you're in violation. And uh, so w it has z SIP CIP 002 all the way to 009, and 008 is what Gary is referring to as having implications on the asset side. So basically, these are non-functional requirements, and by utilities meeting these requirements, they are providing some semblance of security. But compliance does not mean security, and there's a whole other area, even within NERC, that is looking at security and reliability. Uh, the analogy I always make is that you can go to an accredited school but still not get a good education. So uh, <laughs> that's the analogy there. Uh, if there are other questions, I see there are plenty of attendees on the webinar and also here in the seminar. Any questions on the smart grid side? As you can see, that if you went to watch classical music and you saw that big orchestra and you always wondered what that guy with the big cymbals is doing, you know, and somewhere in the concert he just bangs them once just at the right time. So think of asset management as something like that, that everyone says, hmm, what is that? Until you find out that it was critical to the piece that you were listening to in an orchestra or in smart grid, and as you will see in sustainability projects, it's the difference in the IQ of the smart grid. You can call something smart, but how smart something is is really dependent on how efficiently you take data and turn it into actionable intelligence. And a big part of Bob's presentation, he was showing how sophisticated data can be, how multi-dimensional, how multifaceted it can be. And it's important for us to understand that sophistication and build systems that are sensitive to that sophistication so that we can take the appropriate benefits from them. In the absence of this, in a unidimensional data format like, or two-dimensional like an Excel spreadsheet, what we miss are exactly the sophisticated attributes of those data elements. And then we can talk about how to make the data live. And, you know, you mentioned one of the streaming technologies. And that means that if your asset management tool is not sensitive to automatic updates, you're missing out. You don't want to have a passive system where there are manually intensive ways of updating records because that becomes the bottleneck. You mentioned about how in the old days when they had those cards that you would run, it would take the better part of a couple of weeks. I just came into academia on the tail end of that technology, but I know people who walked around with slide rules and had those cards, and it was a 
passage, the rite of passage, you kind of became an adult when you went to the machine hall and ran those cords to do the most basic computations that you could do now with a calculator on your laptop. <laughs> so, but it was necessary. I mean, this is all part of the evolution. And maybe 20 years from now, we'll be sitting laughing at the capabilities we have today because of what we'll be doing in 20 years. Okay, more questions. Question says, uh, smart grid interoperability standards are important. How asset management addresses the interoperability? Go ahead, Bob, if you want to <coughs> say something, and then I have a couple okay. of points. Um, I would say that uh, uh, asset management is all about interoperability. Um, as you look at assets, um, the, the interesting thing about assets is that you don't necessarily need to look at an asset as a single item. An asset could be a group of items that act as a whole. And then, so, so this interoperability between these items are important. But underneath, if you want to look at it from a data perspective, you can, you can capture information and talk about how assets, your, your asset information will say what it works with. There's a lot of interoperability information about assets already out there, different parts. If you look at the different parts that might be part of an aircraft system, for instance, and they do a lot of asset management in, in, in the world of uh, aerospace. And so you've got different parts that are interoperable. Same thing with different elements and things that work together. And it's a matter of capturing that data in the system about the interoperability aspect of these assets. Uh, Irfan, I know that you had a, you've got a different take on that a little bit, I think. Now let me get techy and geeky on you. <laughs> okay. So understand that all these standards for interoperability really manifest themselves at the interfaces. Any vendor's product from within is highly proprietary. And it has to be in order to maintain their edge in the market. Where the standards are needed is where the interface occurs either with other systems that belong to them or to other people. So for instance, if we were to take a router, like a Cisco router, its interfaces have IP addresses. That IP address is governed by request for comments from the Internet Engineering Task Force. One would call them a standard. But how the router itself figures things out inside itself in order to come up with decisions to send the packet down this interface or that interface is a highly proprietary mechanism. And there's no need to expose that. So if we're going to talk about asset management and how interoperability standards for interoperability affect it, I would say that any product who, which is going to be in this space for smart grid, when it comes to the interfaces, it better have an interface for the common information model so that the back-end integration can occur. And I'm talking about the IEC standard 61968 for distribution and 61970 for transmission. I would also say that there has to be some type of mapping between the DNP profiles, which is an IEEE 1815 standard, and the IEC 61850, the substation automation standard. The data elements from the profile, the DNP profile, and the 61850 object models need to either be mapped to the SIM and then have the SIM feed the information into the uh, asset management tool, or have direct interfaces into the asset management tool, whatever is needed. Now, the whole world cannot operate on SIM alone. We need to have for field maintenance and field management of equipment, IEDs, you know, remote terminal units, uh, digital capacitor banks, protective relays, things like that. We need to have DNP and 61850 uh, to do that field management. So there will be a mapping between that and the business side of the 
enterprise which will be run by SIM. So the asset management, if you ask innately, it doesn't need anything. I mean, every system will work with its own way of doing data elements. But when it'll speak to the outside world, it needs to have these interfaces. Question. Uh, it seems like this whole system that we built out, at least that we built out over the period of time for this contract, a lot of moving parts, a lot of building elements of which I would say are in pretty, pretty reference to SIP protocol. You just said it's simply power down the line. Whatever, it's really ramped up to make it so sophisticated and actually so much. Uh, is there Okay, so for the people on the webinar, uh, there was a question from the audience about the complexity of the process by which uh, data is received and sent on the smart grid and how that could potentially damage the grid if it's done in an unmanaged way. And so, yes. So, so right now, if you spend too much power down, it's burning up public transport. It's burning up public Okay, so the question on the complexity and therefore the, live, the risk associated and the concept of a cascading failure that could occur. So this is where the deep expertise of utilities really comes in handy. People who are in this business on the transmission and distribution side have been doing this for years. They know what are acceptable modes of operation. There are ways in which you can check the data. That's why data integrity is so important. And in order to understand what are acceptable messages and what are not acceptable messages, there is a whole area of intrusion detection and prevention. So if there was a nefarious, I think you were talking more about just the system error. So for any of the, whether it's a system error or whether it's actively induced from outside, uh, there are tools available that can show you that you are out of band. In other words, your instruction is not consistent with what the best practices for this particular system are in the mode of operation we're in currently. So there are these, what I would call, uh, they're called colored books, and uh, the Electric Power Research Institute has developed them uh, in collaboration with many utilities, and those are available to utilities. They're best practices on how you run TND systems. So the idea is to bring in the information technology revolution incrementally and not to just drop it on uh, systems that are very paper intensive today or very human intensive. So there is a process and we use the scientific method. They are tested in the lab, there are pilots done, and when it's good enough for the pilot then we bring it into production. So utilities follow a very methodical way. And companies like IBM and, and others who are integrators are actively involved in all of these phases. So they are experts. So it's not quite like some airlines that have pilots that are intoxicated flying the planes. I mean, this is a <laughs> lot more responsible than that. <laughs> okay, other questions? Uh, oh, he... he Dali liked my comment. Okay, and other questions from the audience? Because uh, we went over a lot of material. I mean, Bob really covered a great deal of information on asset management as it pertains to smart grid. Important th takeaways from this presentation. One is that we are definitely moving to a much more complex grid, electric grid, and it's complex both in terms of how many entities are going to be involved in running it? He mentioned the independent power producers and with deregulation, the transmission and distribution and generation are separate. Then you have the energy markets, you know, the, where the trade is done and prices are determined. And then you have consumers that have become prosumers by virtue of their 
solar panels that they can now deliver electricity. So that's one dimension that's becoming very complicated. There are many, many flares. The second complication that is occurring is that there are many, many sources of energy, and each have their own particular attributes from an asset management perspective. And the third thing is that time scales are becoming very, very important. As you integrate larger and larger amounts of renewable energy, solar and wind, you will have to do active control of this network. You cannot have a passive network anymore. You can't just say V equals IR and be done. Yes, V equals IR and Kirchhoff's law in every circuit, but the circuit dynamics changes in real time. So if you don't have a good handle on what resources you have available to take contingency plans, you know, to offset a sudden drop in wind power or a cloud coming over a large area for on solar panels or having some kind of financial disaster that may take out a portion of your grid. All of these things are becoming very real. So when your time scales are very short, you cannot have a manually intensive process. If asset management is a linchpin of your operations, it better be automated. The IOs better occur very smoothly with very clean interfaces where the element of doubt is kept to a minimum. I see I have either bored everyone to death on the webinar or I have left them speechless. So with that, I'm going to go back now that uh, Bob is sufficiently recuperated re re and rehydrated. Yeah, I was trying to use the politically correct term. Um, so I'll bring him back on, and he's going to talk about how asset management is important. You know, we're all trying to reduce the consumption of energy in all forms. And the reason is that it's having an impact on our carbon footprint, but it's also impacting our wallet as the cost of fuel is going up and up and up. So if asset management can help reduce the amount of energy that we consume or become proactive in swapping things out at the right time, why, that's a good thing. So with that, I'll have Bob come back and talk about how asset management can help drive energy reduction. Bob? Okay, thank you. Uh, that's great. Thanks for the stepping in and providing your insights. Very valuable. I always, I always enjoy it a lot. And you said something interesting, and, and asset management, one of the big things with asset management really is risk mitigation. I mean, it's all, you know, they, they, they can play a very important role in risk mitigation. And uh, I'm reminded of something that I was told by the, uh, the director of risk management for the state of Texas at one point. And he said, you know what, asset management's no big deal until it's a big deal, and then it's a really big deal. So, so he, his advice is, do it right up front because if not, you're going to have a really big deal on your hands one of these days. So in terms of, yes, I believe that, uh, you know, asset management can play a really important role in helping organizations and people in general reduce their use of energy. And it can be done with just information that you have and taking some proactive steps, but you have to have the information. And asset management is a good place to do that. I don't know of a single organization that is not trying to reduce their energy usage. Not just because it's going to save them some money, hopefully, if the rates don't go up higher than their thing, but they're going to reduce their energy, but because it's the right thing to do. They're reporting back. They're reporting their sustainability initiatives back, to an or back, back through their organization. Um, we're seeing organizations with chief sustainability officers now, and it is, it is a big deal. And there are a lot of things that one can do, and asset management provides you a tool set to do this with. And so I said stuff. We have lots of stuff out there. If you look at the average organization, what do they have? they got buildings and grounds, whether they're leased or whether they're owned, and they've got parking structures, they've got buildings, they've got outbuildings, they've got shops, a lot of stuff. Then they mostly have vehicles. A lot of organizations have vehicles and different types of vehicles, whether they're trucks, sometimes they have aircraft, they have cars, they've got transit buses, they've got golf carts for moving around their campuses, uh, even places like uh, 
uh, Lawrence Livermore. They've got hydrogen-powered shuttles that they've got going around. Um, then there's the data centers, and the data centers, which consume a lot of electricity. And I sat in a very good data center presentation about how they're really focusing on looking at what they have there and how they can build their data centers to, to really reduce the carbon footprint there. Computing equipment, there's production equipment, and on and on, including the other stuff that's unique to an organization that they might have special. So there's all of these different items that people have, but the one thing that, that, that ties them all together is that they all use energy at some level. And so how can we manage that energy consumption with these, with these different elements? So if you're looking at doing asset management, there's a lot of words on this uh, slide perhaps, but it's what are the high level things that you need to do to manage your assets with a view towards efficiency of energy usage. The first thing, and I think the most important thing, is capture your baseline information, what you're using, and what are the trends. Because that's what you're going to continue to look at week after week, month after month, year after year. What are our trends doing? That's what all organizations are looking for. You know, it's let's try and bring it down by 10%, and let's try next year to bring it down another 10%, and then let's try and bring So they're going to continue to look at trends, and so you need to do metering. You need to meter these things and see, capture the, the energy usage in whatever way is appropriate for the type of assets you have, and I'll talk about it a little bit of it later. And then you need to be able to do what-if scenarios or what-if analysis and scenario-based forecasting. So if you know that you have a group of assets that use this much energy, and I'm going out to look and procure some new things to replace this, if I can find something that's got an energy footprint that's 20% below it, what should that mean to me? Furthermore, if you're looking at your energy port, I mean your, your asset portfolio, you can do that what if. What if we made a change with these elements? What if I moved and changed all of my vehicles to hybrid vehicles and I make a change? What should that mean to me over time? And then you go back to the first thing and then say, okay, did, did it really happen, right? Because you're gonna do that trending. So you need to track, you wanna track your upgrades to your facilities because you're gonna continue to make upgrades to the way that you uh, the way you, you provision light for people and, and how you're using different things, uh, maybe switches might be uh, changes in, in your HVAC and the temperatures that you do. So you want to track that. And then continuing at multiple levels, all of these assets have the ability to capture the information that you have because we're dealing in an environment where they are electronic generally and you can capture information that's there and you can get it in real time. So you also want to be able to break it down by business group. You want to be able to break it down by location, whether it's on a floor or whether it's on a campus. Why is that important? I think that's important is because you want to do these things incrementally. The same way that everyone was saying, you don't want to build out the grid all at once, big bang, you need to do it slowly. That's the same thing that you're going to be doing when you're looking at your initiative. Is this work? Did we, did we see the savings? Did we recover what we were looking at? And if so, then let's go try it somewhere else and see if we get the same result. So you need to be able to bring it down and look at it at, at a level that allows you to look at it from a granular basis and not just trying to look at it globally across your entire organization. So let's talk about some different elements in asset management. First of all, in the procurement world. When you procure something, that's when an asset gets into the system. And so you can capture attributes about that thing that you bought. And you can look at it and say, well, we're going to go buy some things and it's going to be bio-based or it's, it's going to be, you know, we, we want to buy things that got a recycled content of a certain percentage. And then you can report those purpose, the, those purchases back because that's really important to a lot of organizations. How much am I buying that's coming in from, from different uh, uh, levels of energy efficiency? Or including in that procurement side, actually, is how much did I avoid procuring 
because I reused something that I already had. A lot of people forget what that means, but there is so much energy. If you've, if you've all seen the, the story of stuff, familiar with that movie, The Story of Stuff, how much energy is actually used in producing something up front? What are the natural resources? One of the greatest things that you can do is reuse something that you already got inside your organization. And that's really a procurement decision because people normally are saying, well, we need something else, procurement gets involved. So procurement is a place where you can absolutely take a look and, and, and start getting some metrics about your energy efficiency. Then facilities. What can you do around facilities and the energy efficiency there? Well, you want to first thing that a lot of organizations are not even doing is capturing what their meters are telling them. What am I, how much am I actually using here and how deep can I go and what am I trending over time? And do I have multiple meters? Can I get it down to the point where there's more meters that are going in? And I think from what I read, they're looking at actually putting more smart meters in. Instead of one giant meter outside the building here, now they'll have meters that are, that are like an apartment building, where it's for each separate area within the organization, they can meter it. Because you can look at that. And then you can track your upgrades that you do and actually validate it against those meters. All right, we made these changes. We expected to see a reduction of 20%. Are we really seeing that? Because that's going to weigh on future decisions as to what we are going to do. So you need to be able to pull that information in, and that is, happens to be an attribute of a physical asset, the physical asset being this segment of the building and the meter telling me what I'm using here today. And as I make changes, Am I seeing the changes ripple through? And it's just an attribute of our stuff, and our stuff happens to be this, this segment of the building. And then, obviously, you want to be able to support checklists for lead certification, energy efficiencies, and things like that. Vehicles. Right? It's, I mentioned earlier about capturing some of the information about vehicles. This is really important. And this is being done by the federal government pretty effectively today. If anybody's part of the federal government, you've seen what they're, what they're tracking and the initiatives that they've got in place for making sure that they um, look at alternative fuel vehicles and get their fleets in the right way. But track the different kinds of vehicles that you're acquiring, the different types of fuel that they're using, uh, whether it's you know gas, diesel, natural gas, hybrid kind of vehicles. Identify those starts, and then capture that fuel consumption over time. That's easy to do, actually, because if you've got a fleet in your organization, you've got somebody managing that fleet. They're keeping track of when they put gas in it. They're keeping track of the miles. They're keeping track of where it's being used. Most of that is sitting out in some system that's being a silo out there, and it's being used by the fleet people. The technology exists today to pull that data in and put it into a main system where you can look at it from an asset. This is what's being done. It's just it's data. You can pull it in. So now you can start reporting on individual vehicles, how they're being used, how they're being driven. And by doing that, now you can start making some intelligent decisions about how we can change the complexity or the complexion of our fleet to meet the needs of how we're using our vehicles to maximize the efficiency of these vehicles and minimize our footprint on petroleum or other types of energy sources that we're using there. And then, of course, be able to start tracking things like your recharge station and your charging of electric vehicles and the consumption of that because that is going to start coming up. More and more people are going to want to see and the CFOs, the financial people, are we really getting the value of our, out of our electric vehicles? The only way that you can do that is actually see what is it charging, what is it costing us, is it, is it a good use of our dollars and our resources for that particular type of vehicle? And that applies to all the vehicles. So look at your fleet, and all you have to do is capture some additional information, and most systems will allow you to do that today because it's an attribute that's part of an asset, and with databases today, you're going to look at it from that particular side of the attributes. Electronics. 
You can look at electronics. You can look at the different, like if you're buying computers, the EP certifications. And you might say, well, we're all EP silver. We want to go EP gold. And if we went all to EP gold, what should we see? Are we going to get there? What is it going to be? Well, most people say, well, we're going to do that and we're good. We've just gone to EP silver. Do you know if you're actually saving energy or not? You can't really validate that back unless you capture the data. And you can capture that information and bring it in. You can keep it with, with, with the items. And then at the end of its life, we got to recycle. How many people were of the bulletin that came out from the GSA and the federal government where it's a zero landfill for electronics? Have you seen that? It came out in uh, May. Nothing, nothing may be put, I mean, everything must be recycled. All electronics must be recycled that the federal government owns. Well, that's a, almost mission impossible. <laughs> yeah, but it, that's, that's what, and they, they have the recyclers. They put it in place. They did a lot of study. The policy is out. And, uh, you know, moving forward, I expect that, that generally, you know, the commercial markets will follow suit. Obviously, the state governments, California, is following suit on it already. And, uh, and there will be zero. They will, they will recycle 100% the electronics and the computers. I'm sorry? You know, I, I don't have the answer to that. But I believe it was effective immediately. By the federal government. Well, it's 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 in the it's in the disposal cycle, right? It's in the disposal cycle. From now on, everything will be go through recyclers. <laughs> the Hudson River. <laughs> It is going to create a brand new industry, and uh, I was uh, I was reading a study uh, that said uh, that they were proposing a, a that 75 percent of all things must be recycled. Everything we have must 75 percent must be fully recycled, and they claim they claimed that, that would that would that would open up an industry of two million jobs by putting a recycling plan in place. So there's a lot of there's a lot of things that can be recycled. A lot of precious metals. Right, and a lot of a lot of additional um, material that can be recycled and reused. So, but there, and there are more that just couldn't be recycled yet. Wow. We'll let Irfan take a take yeah. a swing at that one. The, the thing to remember is that if it takes more energy to recycle the what is left compared to what it will take to go to the mountain and get the fresh ore and do it, that's when you stop, because then it gets into the realm of being ridiculous. But as long as the endothermic reactions that are needed don't require that much enthalpy, the delta H, because that's what it comes down to, I mean, there's a certain amount that you can do by physical separation, mechanical processes. But then when you really get down to it, you'll have to use some chemical processes to separate some of those finished products to go back to those bare elements that you need. If the energy required to extract it from the mountain exceeds the enthalpy to run those endothermic reactions by electric separa magnetic separation and other things, then yes, do it. But if the material that's coming out of the mountain and all the diesel and the forklifts that you need is less than the endothermic reactions that you need, then you don't do it. You go to the mountain and get it. And the problem has been that we have cast a blind eye to a major part of recycling, which could be done, but it was just a nuisance and we didn't want to deal with it. Now, because of resource constraints, we're obliged to look at it. But that doesn't mean that we enter the realm of being ridiculous. Because if that energy exceeds, then we're really not helping the planet. But, but that makes also makes the assumption that the mountain is there and its supply of ore is infinite. And yes. we know that that's not true. So the point was that uh, if the mountain is not there, then it won't come to you. <laughs> <laughs> So the uh, 
that, that's true. And uh, what also another thing is that we have a lot of artificial barriers in the way we do trade in the world. So there may be mountains where there are resources available at very good prices, but because of political and other problems, we may not have access to that. So there are always these artificial barriers to the free trade system. Uh, but I think that we, just like there's one department that is con focused on energy efficiency and sustainability, there has to be another department within each enterprise that keeps looking at the big picture and, and to make sure that no semi comes and hits you from the side uh, by being too focused on just sustainability. Yes. So the point was made uh, by a member of the audience that uh, it depends on how you set up your infrastructure. If you set it up in a way that allows for uh, what I would call more modular uh, manufacturing, uh, that allows uh, easier separation of the individual components at the end of life cycle, then the logic of going to the mountain and getting it out for cheaper would not hold because it would be easier to disassemble the uh, product that has reached its end of life cycle. And there needs to be more thought put mm -hmm. on the front end when we are building products so that the end of uh, life cycle is more economical in taking those raw materials. Because it, it won't just be about the carbon footprint. It really comes down to labor and the cost of labor and it's going up to even go, I and mean, there are fewer and fewer people who want to go to the mountain and dig stuff because it affects their health. And you know, the new generation wants to do different things. So there's a, there are a lot of social changes as well as economic changes. The key thing to keep in mind is that we have been a very wasteful society. With 5% of the world's population, we consume about half of the resources. So there's almost a 10 to 1 ratio. Now, if we want to teach people in China and Brazil and India and other growing economies best practices, we, we need to practice them ourselves. We can't continue to be wasteful and tell them, oh, you have the billions of people, go be more economical and more energy efficient. So we have to practice what we preach. And what Bob is trying to do in this presentation is show that there's some very easy quantitative systems that are available to us today, that if we were just to take the data that is being produced from them and parse them properly and put them in the appropriate bins, create the proper data elements with the different attributes and track them, we could identify which energy efficiency projects are working for us and which ones are not working for us. So the ones that are not working for us, we could redesign and have this ability to measure metrics. This is what this is all about, is having metrics for sustainability projects. So Bob? Yeah. <coughs> and in a, uh, just, to, just to, to, to glom on to that, is that we're gonna capture that. Because when we end of life something, because we're capturing the entire life cycle of this asset, we'll capture what it costs at the end of the life. And a recycler, is not going to take your stuff and lose money on recycling. Mm -hmm. You're going to pay for it. You're going to pay the market cost for doing that recycling. And so you're going to be able to capture that, and you will be able to make decisions. You may find it costs you more to recycle 100% than have it 
put in a landfill or something through through however method you decide to, to end of life this particular item. That may be a decision that you want to make that you're willing to spend the more money because it's the right thing to do, but you will have those metrics. You will know what it costs because you're capturing that, and you'll be able to trend it over time as well because, again, that's another data element that you're capturing, and that's going to drive the metrics and your uh, analytical processes for what is the best use of your dollars versus the resources that you're using and your objectives in your organization for sustainability. So everybody wants to, to uh, reduce our dependence on oil, right? How much oil is being used? So your asset management system will allow you to track that because you've got the vehicles in there. You can identify what type of petroleum is being used, how much you're using, the cost of those things. Um, by vehicle, how much is it costing per mile, how much you're using, and trend how you are saving fuel over time as you bring up new, new types of uh, uh, vehicles. Same thing is the, 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 the kind of the counter to that is the increase in your alternative fuels and alternative energy. In this case, maybe electricity is a fuel for driving your car because you're using it. But you're going to track that because you've got these vehicles, you've got the, uh, the, the item, and you know what's happening. In, you can capture it in real time if you want, but more so, it's time-based metering. And you're going to hear that over and over again, time-based metering. And it all kind of comes back to that because we want to look at it over time. It does, we really can't get any value out of looking at your asset base at a single point in time. And that's where most people are with their assets today. They've got a fixed, here's my list of assets, and this is what I have. And what I'm suggesting is that you can capture that information and say, this is, this is a living thing, and then we're seeing time. Did you have a question? Okay, yes. Uh, the question was, uh, when you're advocating this, who, is, who do you go advocate to inside the organization? And that depends on the organization. Really, it depends on the organization. But at the end of the day, I think it's a CFO or in the financial area because in most organizations, it's about costs. And what can I do to reduce my costs? Yes, it's important for us to be sustainable to be a sustainable organization. Yes, we want to do the right thing, but at the end of, when, when, when the final analysis is done, it's an element of how many dollars do I have available to what can I do? So what we're trying to do here is save people money. Yes, we're saving the planet, but there is a cost involved and that cost is continuing to go up. The cost is continuing to go up. So there are many people that would be involved. If you've got an organization where there's a sustainability officer, they will want to do that because they'll be want, wanting to report it up. But they, have, they want to report their progress, and it doesn't necessarily relate to dollars. They don't have a profit motive there, but the organization has a profit motive. And it doesn't matter if they're a not-for-profit organization. It doesn't matter if they're the government. It doesn't matter if they're a commercial organization. It's at the end of the day, there's a limited number of dollars, and you want to maximize your use of those dollars. So typically, typically it's in the finance side where they will make that decision because it is a financial decision. Okay, that's a good question. The question is, okay, so, so even if you make the sale, there's a, so much other within the organization that you have to work with and you need to integrate with their systems. And so what are the challenges with that? It has gotten much easier 
in the last few years because we find that most systems are integrated already today. There is there's integrations in place. Um, most people have an ERP, a, a big enough organization that's going to look at at the level of uh, sophistication for looking at energy efficiency at this level is uh, is going to probably have some sort of an ERP, which means you've already got a number of systems that are fully integrated. Even if they're not part of the same platform, they've got integrated. So you see a lot of SAP or PeopleSoft or Oracle or JD Edwards or even you know Microsoft. They're out there, but then they've got some ancillary programs that are doing things for them, but they're integrated. The data is being shared. So it's an, you have to work through, obviously, the IT group to do the data integrations. But data, with the advent of web services and SOAP and a lot of the protocols that are out there, it's much easier to integrate data these days than it's ever been in the past. Um, it's, uh, you know, what, in, in our business 10 years ago, it used to take three weeks to write an interface, and that can be done in a matter of a couple of days. It has really changed um, substantially because everybody needs to share data. I mean, data is what's making the world go around, and that's what, we're, that's what we need to do. We need to capture a lot of data in order to do this. But we also need to provide that data back out. So that is one of the challenges. The biggest challenge to doing this is usually... Um, the mentality of, we don't do it that way. I've been doing it like this for 10 years, and I don't want to change, right? Wait till I retire. There's the, the human inertia is what I call that. You've got human inertia that people are doing it, you know, and, and making changes is difficult for a lot of people. And that's, that is the biggest challenge is getting the new mindset for people to, to make it to the next level. But I think with the advent of the chief sustainability officer and the sustainability initiatives and the human aspect of this in organizations. There is a lot of reaching out to the individuals and saying we want to be sustainable. You know, we're going to this. Please recycle. Let's use our 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 our, our potato based plates and forks, you know, that are gonna that are comp compostable. Um, and we are going to use, you know, um, we're encouraging people to use public transportation, where we're making uh, financial incentives for people to be more um, sensible about their use of resources. So you've got the people behind it. So changing something for sustainability purposes is easier today than changing it for some other purposes. Okay, did that answer your question? Okay, it's always a challenge doing something new. It's always a challenge doing something new, but I think that, that my experience with this has been that people can get on board this bus because they can see the value to the organization, they can see the value to society itself, and then they can translate into value for themselves. Um, okay. A lot of organizations that I'm finding don't even know how much energy they're using. You might find that kind of strange, but most of them aren't tracking. The bills come in and they get paid out of accounts payable. They can tell you what they paid for bills. They can't tell you how much they used at a particular location. And we're trying to help organizations say, well, why don't you take a look? Take a look at your electric bill. Take a look at your gas bill. And what are the things that you can do? What about your water bill? And there's a lot of different um, things that can be done, but until you know what you're spending and how much you're using, you don't have a baseline. And so that's a very, very interesting place to start. And we go and say, I was talking with a, I'm not going to name names, but I was talking with an organization here, public organization, and they're like, we have, we don't, we couldn't tell you what our energy usage is. We couldn't tell you if it's going up or down. We can go get the bills and tell you what the cost was, but we're not capturing the elements of, of what we used. And we believe, we believe you should actually catch, you know, the cost is one thing and that's interesting and all the rest of that, but you want, how many kilowatt hours did we use this month, right? And can we spot some trends and can we manage that a little bit better? Um, then there's the whole thing with water conservation. You know, the, the water is, is a very scarce resource. Uh, Last Call at the Oasis, anybody get a chance to see that film? If you haven't seen Last Call at the Oasis, I, I recommend it. It's a very interesting film talking about... Uh, you know, the fresh water supply and what that means for us. 
And so we want to help organizations see if they can conserve fresh water. And in order to do that, you can track it. Most campuses are using water. They're using water in different ways. And so what can we do? Can we, can we look at it by meters? Again, it's that meter aspect and a time base aspect. And then look at, you know, if you want to upgrade, can you upgrade different elements? Can you switch to um, different types of water? Can you use recycled water in part of your organization? It may take replumbing. It may take an investment on your part to be able to use recycled water, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe gray water or recycled water to use that. It may take some infrastructure upgrades but we can take a look at what impact that has and you can do cost benefit analysis on that because again, it's asset based. Oh yes. Uh, the question is, do I know anybody that's, uh, any company that's doing kits for, uh, for, for retrofitting for using re recycled water? The answer is I do not know. I don't know of any any particular company, and, and I'm not close to that enough to know who's doing that. Anybody else in the room? Well, there is, there are technologies that uh, NASA is using in sustainability base, uh, where they have retrofitted with recyclable, so that they can recycle their water. So that's one good demo mm -hmm. of this all around. Yes, and, uh, and, and, and Irfan was saying that uh, NASA at their sustainability-based complex at, uh, at the Ames Research Center, it's, uh, it's a very, very impressive building, actually. I, I think it could be the greenest building in, in the United States, but certainly in this area. Uh, and they actually, their, their recycled water process there, quite interesting, that was, that was from their spacecraft, the space shuttle, because they used to recycle the fluids on the spacecraft and turn it back into drinking water. Right? So they're using that technology to do it. So um, then the last thing I want to talk about is non electronics recycling. Because the other thing is that what about what other kinds of things can you recycle? And uh, we uh, we've got a client that's a that's a large uh, college district and uh, they bought all recycled carpet and it is recycled when they bought it and it's gonna be recycled when it needs to be put back in. Also they're chairs like this is all recycled materials and when they wear out the deal calls for taking all of the furniture and the carpet back and recycling it again and putting it back out and so there's a um, you can track that as a sustainability measure and um, I don't know how much it costs relative to it but apparently it's a, it's a very good investment for the environment and uh, and sometimes Sometimes you have to invest a little bit more to make things right, so it's there. Okay. Uh, the last thing is all around personnel, and I wouldn't exactly call these assets, but it's all human capital assets and human capital asset management, and you're seeing that coming out now. But you can also track elements in your asset system because it is things like telecommuting days, if they're using uh, transportation. Uh, some of our customers, um, uh, particularly in the federal government, provide transit benefits to their employees and they're able to track that in the asset management system because it is an asset, the transit benefit is a, they look at it as an asset, they're tracking that asset, they're bringing it in, and they're able to use that and make some additional um, uh, metrics around how much carbon they're avoiding by having people take transit benefits as opposed to driving in or other methods of transportation. Um, and then other things like using WebEx, like today, we saved uh, with, with, the, with the hundreds of people that are on worldwide right now, how much, how much jet fuel did we save by getting them in here for this uh, online webinar. So, uh, so it's all about the data. At the end of the day, you need to capture the data and you buy, and, you, and it's important that you look at the data in context to what you're attempting to do here, which is sustainability. And that's a different thing than you're doing for reliability. The paths cross. 
and you have the same data elements and that same underlying main record that people are going to be looking at, but the but the individual attributes that you want to look at are different. So you got to take this data and you got to turn that into information. That information becomes knowledge to you now. With that knowledge, then you can take some action. Once you've got that action, then you can look at the outcomes and the results and then put some processes in place. So I believe that you can improve your asset utilization because one of the things that you look at when you're doing your asset management is am I using it enough? Most organizations can get rid of a percentage of their stuff, something like 20% of the stuff, and never miss it because it goes unused. Recycle that. Get it back in there. Put it in the secondary market. Keep them from using more raw materials to build something new. You can reduce your maintenance cost, lower your cost of ownership. You can budget. You can go ahead and forecast. You're not going to be buying as much. So you reduce your capital expenditures. Risk mitigation is really important. You got a lot of different risks. If it doesn't work, if my line goes down, if I if they find this CRT in a landfill with my sticker on it someplace, if it gets shipped overseas and it shouldn't be shipped overseas, asset management is really important. There's a lot of different things that come into play with that. So we talk about green practices. We don't believe it's not just about green. In fact, it's really about best business practices. And that is know what you have, why you've got it, maximize its use, reduce its footprint that it has on the planet, and maximize the benefits to your organization. You will decrease spending, you'll make smarter decisions, and you're going to end up with a better bottom line. And as I mentioned earlier, that's what most organizations are looking at. It's all about the cost. Can I reduce the cost? The other things are important and very important. It may be the driving factor, but the investments get made based on the cost. So just as I conclude here, is there a vector between the two things that I talked about? And I believe that there is. We're talking about the smart grid, and I get to put on my Imagineer hat for a while because it's not there right now. But if I put my Imagineer hat on and I could say, wait, in my organization, if I know what I've got, how much it's using, where it is, how it's going, when that smart grid comes up and gets to the point where it can communicate with my devices, now my devices can communicate out, the grid can communicate in, and I'm going to get that much more data that's going to make me that much more effective, that's going to allow us to, to really forecast energy usage that much more and find ways to reduce it, use it at different times, and be quite effective uh, with it and identifying it. And it's going to be particularly effective when we get there for anomalies because that's what we can see most is when something sticks out. And that's what we're going to look at in the data is we get to the point, we're going to look at our energy usage and we're going to see where there's an anomaly and then we can go fix that. Um, so with that, just a, just a message from my sponsor here today. Uh, I, I belong to uh, Sunflower Systems and there's a lot of systems out there, you know, uh, and, and a lot of these systems can do it. We are just one of many, you know, I know IBM who's hosting us here today They've got great asset management software, and, and they can do it. But, you know, we, have a, we do real property, personal property. We have mobile applications. We use RFID technology, analytics, as well as other um, uh, real-time data acquisition. We specialize in large organizations, federal government, state and local universities, national labs. Here located in uh, San Ramon, we're local. If anybody wants any information, you're... You're welcome to get it from me. I'd be happy to talk to you offline at another point in time. And uh, with that, my contact information is here. I want to thank you very much, and I'll open it up for any additional questions that anybody might have at this time. Thank you very much, Bob. And I will go back here to our question mode and see if there are any questions. From well, the audience has been asking questions uh, in the seminar, but I'd like to invite the people from the webinar if they have any questions. And while you think about your questions, I would like to 
make a few comments about asset management as an industry. We talked about tools, but for an enterprise to really benefit from these tools, it requires a professional services engagement. It's not something where you just download a copy of Sunflower Systems or IBM Maximo and just start working with it. And for mid to large size organizations that really need these types of tools in order to significantly reduce their operational costs and make better use of their natural resources, they need to have companies like Sunflower and IBM and others that are in the market come in and understand how they do their business in order to customize their products to meet that need. Quite often, we have saw this in network management, by the way, about 10, 15 years ago, where people saw some article in PC Magazine or red herring or something, and they just mad dash, they went and bought the software. And it was the time when blind men could get jobs at, as night watchmen. I'm talking about the dot-com boom. Uh, they went by vibrations in the air. They didn't have to see the intruder. So apparently there was a possibility to be blind and, and be a watchman. But anyway. There was that period of time. What happened as a result of that period was that about 90% of the software that dealt with network management sat on the shelves of the people who purchased it. After an initial pilot, the person left because job turnover was really good, and there was absolutely no instructions left for the next person. And so the next person went and bought their favorite tool. So in this environment where people are budget constrained, you have to be very, very strategic about your investments in information technology. And asset management, because it is so esoteric, needs the proper explanation. So Bob kind of hinted along the way that it involves people, it involves business process. So if you are an organization that is looking at asset management, don't just go and buy tools. Get the people, and this is where the deep expertise is needed, that people who have gone up that learning curve understand what best practices are, can save you a lot of time and a lot of pain, which would otherwise be spent by you with that CD and that aggressive salesman saying, hey, you just download it, it's going to work for you. It's not going to work for you. I'm going to give you a heads up on that. Having been in that IT industry 10, 15 years ago and seen those CDs on the shelf and helping those organizations never do that again, <laughs> I, I learned the hard way. Now I want to talk a little bit about the focus of this series, this educational series. Notice the name is Smart Grid Educational Series. There's no mention of energy anywhere in the name. And the reason why I didn't put energy is because water, fuel, and electricity have a lot in common. And going forward, they're all going to involve geographically distributed systems with intelligent nodes. They will require some type of SCADA to manage them. And rather than learn this art three times, why don't we learn it once? And apply those high-level concepts of managing distributed intelligent assets, whether it be in electricity or in fuels or in water, with the same concept, that same concept of an architecture, layered concept where security is needed, network management is needed, data integration is needed, and you need the proper training of personnel to work with those systems so that they're not victims to social engineering schemes. So you find that there's a lot of commonality, and I wanted to create an educational forum where all these three groups could come together and learn from each other. I will tell you, and by the way, chemicals are also involved in this. When I say fuels, I also mean chemicals. They are a little ahead of the electric 
industry, in my opinion, in terms of systems integration, data integration, and they have been running oil and gas in pipes that run thousands of miles all over the world. And they have ships that carry natural gas to ports and then they're put back into pipes. So that you can see they have a pretty elaborate system. And they've been using a lot of the practices that we are now just beginning to use in the electric sector when we talk about smart grid. So as you're thinking about smart grid, focus on the smart and the grid and don't immediately insinuate from it that that just lim is limited to electricity. That's key takeaway from our seminar today and setting the state so that if you know people who are in the fuels and water business who are doing this for a living, please send them my way because I would love for them to come and present. Notice today Bob did not come from the electric sector. He came from the asset world. But he knows that if you have things, uh, I can do something about the things. Um, we are going to have a 20-minute networking break, and then we're going to come back between 6.20 and 7 p.m. for about 40 minutes. We're going to have a little discussion. We're going to have Chris Hackard from IBM and Bob Kaler from SunPower talk as subject matter experts in the area of managing assets. Now, um, Chris uh, is our host, but Chris wears many hats at IBM. And one of his hats is that he has been an architect for smart grid. And I will tell you that he will be the first one to tell you that it's not limited to electricity. And he's looking at those commonalities even in his own practice. So having these two people who are what I'd call outliers in the industry, who think out of the box, I think it's going to be a very fun panel discussion. So uh, let's see. Uh, there's another question here before we uh, break to our networking break. How would you do cost-benefit analysis for asset management projects solutions? So we talked a little bit about that. Uh, the key thing is to have the proper metrics so that all the widgets are properly counted. And then you can do a before and after analysis. Or you could do an ongoing analysis, especially if you have a baseline and then you're doing trending. And then you can periodically create reports. So having the proper data elements and extracting the data in what he called time-based metering that concept is very important in projects like this to see the gains that you're making from your energy efficiency initiatives. But it's not just energy initiative efficiency initiatives. We talked about conserving water and also conserving fuel because there's an energy element in fuels also. I mean, it's just in different forms. But overall, it's about resource efficiency because ultimately the planet is not just carbon. The planet has multiple facets, and we have to collectively conserve it in order for it to be livable. So with that, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to stop the recording of this session, and then we'll start a new recording after the break so you don't have to hear the crunching of the nacho chips on the WebEx. So thank you very much again for all of you who participated. For those of you who are on the webinar, after about 20, 25 minutes, we're going to resume. I'm going to maintain the WebEx session. I'm just going to stop the recording.